So, uh, last lecture I started talking about four point conformant blocks. So, just to remind the notation, we're considering four point function of primary operators. And we expanded it in some of our intermediate operators, some of our three point tensor structures. For peak coefficients, times conformal blocks. And uh, these blocks also carry the same indices as the local operators uh, in the correlation function and they have the same conformal transformation properties as four point function. So we can expand these blocks in the basis of four point functions, four point function uh, tensor structures. So after we do this, we get a function of cross ratios, and uh, it depends on the scale dimension of intermediate operator, its spin D representation, a pair of three point tensor structure, and the four point tensor structure. And these functions are just numbers. So the goal is to compute these functions, and I promised you that uh, all these functions can be expressed as derivatives of. Uh, scalar conformal blocks in the sense that any G A B delta rho I is B is some differential operator which carries this indices. Uh, acting on a scalar conformal block of some particular spin. This is a differential operator is a differential operator in Z and Z bar. So this is not entirely correct because uh, what, happened, what happened in reality is that we get a sum over several conformal blocks, over several scalar conformal blocks, and the dimension and spin of scalar conformal blocks as well as external dimensions, dimensions of external scalar operators will depend well, there will be several sets of such quantum numbers and we will need to differentiate them and sum, but still this all reduces to scalar conformal blocks. So what I will do now is I will explain how to construct these differential operators. Um, so I will not be talking about differential operators in Z and Z bar. Instead, I will be talking about differential operators in the original coordinates x1, x2, and so on. So since conformal blocks, both general and scalar, transform as conformally invariant four-point functions, it, the differential operators that we need are going to apply to them are going to be conformally invariant differential operators. And the simplest type of conformal invariant differential operator is a, a is a differential operator which you can apply to one primary and uh, so this primary has some index you know, alpha so we will contract this index alpha to get new index beta and this will transform as a new primary operator so this was dimension delta and spin rho, and this will be some dimension delta prime and spin rho prime. So I must say that uh, for the next, I don't know, some time, for, for during the entire discussion about conformal blocks, 
you will not see physical correlation functions or physical operators. Every, every time I write an operator O or I write down something like O1, O2, O3, I mean uh, fictitious tensor structures, fictitious operators, just things which represent their conformal transformation properties. These are not physical operators. This is some convenient notation um, which allows me to avoid saying that if you take something which transforms as a primary, differentiated, you get something else which transforms as a primary, I'll just write equations like this. So this is the simplest type of uh, differential operator you can imagine, but it is easy to see that there aren't too many such differential operators, and they only exist for a discrete set of scaling dimensions delta. The reason for that is that, well, first observation is that if this is a differential operator of order n, then scaling variance implies that, well, not necessarily differential operator of order n, okay. So if, if you have this identity, this differential operator has to be translational invariant, so it can depend on the position of the, of O. So it's just a combination of derivatives. And then if it's differential operator of order n, then delta prime is delta plus n. But then, since it's conformally invariant, it should commute with all the conformal generators, in particular with quadratic Casimir, and it must have the equation which says the quadratic Casimirs of these two primary operators are equal. So here, C2 of rho is a quadratic Casimir of spin d. Uh, and this combination is a quadratic Casimir of conformal group. So since there is a, this relation between delta prime and delta, you can see that this gives you an equation for delta, and the quadratic term actually cancels, so it's a linear equation in delta and gives you a unique solution. So if you fix rho and rho prime and the order of differential operator, there is only one delta for which the differential operator can be conformally invariant. This is not good for our purposes because we don't want to make any assumptions on the dimensions of the external operators in our four-point function. So this kind of differential operators which act just in one primary will not work for us. Are there any questions about this argument? Yes? Sorry, if you're saying that differential operators can formally invariant, why is there no of Casimir? <coughs> it is only a function of Casimirs if it's uh, well, Casimir acting on a single operator is a number. There is no differential operator which acts on a single primary and represents the ca Casimir. And uh, if you ask for, for differential operators which take you from dimension delta to dimension delta and from representation row to representation row, then indeed you only get numbers. The differential operators I'm talking about here are more general because I allow them to change the quantum numbers of the operator. The Casimirs would not do that. There is no real difference between words covariant and invariant. It just depends on what do, how do you define them. But uh, <laughs> you think about two Verman modules, and there is a map between them, and this map is a is a, is a uh, homomorphism of representations. Uh, <laughs> I don't like to think it. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh <clears throat> so an let to just clarify the point, an example of this differential operator is d mu j mu transforms as a scalar, where j is dimension uh, um, uh, d minus 1, and scalar is dimension 1. So uh, this dimension is fixed by this equation and by the fact that you go from a vector to a scalar. So this will not work for us. So the solution will be to uh, look, look at differential operators which act on more points than one. And the thing that I'll focus for now is differential operators which act on two points, but this will fact, in fact allow us to generalize to uh, any number of points. So we already know an example of this differential operator. 
So imagine we have a pair of primaries. Uh, at different points. And then we just multiply it by min uh, minus one half times x1 minus x2 squared. So this thing looks like a two point function uh, of a scalar with dimension minus one. So and also, it's not really a differential operator, but it's a differential operator of zero order, which is the best they can do for now, but then we'll write something which is actually a differential operator. Since it transforms like scalars, at point x1 it transforms as a scalar with dimension minus one, and point x2 it also transforms like a scalar dimension minus one, then this thing transforms as a primary, as a pair of primary operators at the same points. Uh, but the dimension delta 1 prime is delta 1 minus 1, and delta 2 prime is delta 2 minus 1. So it's kind of a trivial example, but just to il illustrate how this kind of differential operators can be useful, uh, recall that, imagine that we have a, a three-point function three-point tensor, three tensor structure of these two operators with some uh, third operator. So this, by this for now I mean just sim similar to what David did, I just mean some conformally invariant expression, which is not a physical correlation function, just an explicit function. And it transforms under conformal transformations as a three-point function. Now if I multiply by this object, then this will transform as a three-point function for the, for the prime operators. <coughs> and so uh, we, had, we started with a three-point function for operators with one set of scaling dimensions, and we multiply by this object, we get a three-point function of operators with other set of scaling dimensions. Now, this is kind of a dumb example because, we, of course, just know that the scaling dimension enter in three-point functions in terms of precisely products of this form, and we're just mo modifying the powers of these products. So it's not interesting. But after we generalize this picture, it will actually become very interesting. For now, I just want to... Uh, draw a picture for this, a pictorial representation for this identity. So we have a three-point function which I'll just denote in this way. And then, then we have this operators one and two. And we apply this thing which I'll for now just denote as a black box. But because I, my blackboard is black, I'll dash it to his white. Uh, and it produces operators two prime and one prime. And by produce, I again just mean the conformal transformation properties. Now if you just forget what is inside of this thing, you see that on the outside it looks like a three-point function, so it must be proportional to some standard three-point function. Operators two prime, one prime, and three. And if it's just that in this example, we have this very simple conformally invariant black box. If we had a more complicated conformally invariant black box, we would still have a relation of this form, and these new operators will be more interesting. For example, we'll, uh, we will see soon how we can actually, say, increase the spin of operators two and two prime. So we will see an example where these operators, the primed operators, have a different spin. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the powers of x2, 3, and x1, 3, they only involve differences of uh, delta 1 minus delta 2. And since you shift delta 1 and delta 2 by the same amount, these powers don't change. It's not. It's, 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 it's not true. Is there any underlying 
Oh, that, yeah, all right. If, you, if this is what you call a priori, then yes, and uh, I will explain what this reason is. Uh, uh, okay, so now let me just uh, mention why this is useful for conformal blocks. And the reason is that there is this representation of conformal block, which they talked about. The shadow representation. I mean, it's, you don't have to use shadow representation. You can use any other representation, but for the shadow representation, it's easier to argue. So the conformal block, uh, they would explain that it's not precisely equal, but it's a part of the integral of I don't think, okay, just, just let's ignore our daggers of this form where this operator is at point x and the spin indices of O and O tile are <coughs> contracted. And this is the shadow op operator which transforms this shadow scaling dimension. Um, yeah, it's, it's a dagger here. Um, so the idea is that this thing is equal to block plus a shadow block, but there is a simple procedure to extract just the block from this integral, or you can write different versions of this integral, which uh, say in Lorentzian signature, which directly produce just the block. So I will not go into details of this procedure, but this is a fine representation for all our purposes of the conformal block. So now we see, uh, I will use a following pictorial representation of this. So we have two th three point functions. And uh, I'll just use the across to denote that we glue them in this way. It's not precise to this, but it will be fine for our purposes. So uh, now we just apply this picture here. We put this black box. And this was a conformal block for operators one, two, three, four. And now we see that using this identity, we see that this is a proportional to three point functions, three point function for operators two prime and one prime. So this becomes proportional to conformal block representations one prime and two prime. And uh, this is kind of, again, trivial in this case because the conformal blocks, as David mentioned, do not actually depend on the different, do not depend in, a, in an essential way on the differences between scaling dimensions. So uh, this is a, you can think of this as a way of proving this, that it depends on difference of, uh, sorry, dependence on delta one plus delta two is only through this kind of factors. But it will become one, non-trivial in a second when we get more interesting uh, two-point formally invariant operators. Now, let, to proceed, let us try to understand better why this operator is actually conformally invariant. And the simple way to see this, I mean, I already told you that this is a two-point function of scalar operators, which kind of explains it. But the reason why I chose power two is because in this case you can write it as x one m dot x two. So x one dot x two, where x and large x's are the vectors from embedding formalism. So. Uh, in here in particular, we use the, I should probably write this more explicitly, that we have x1, which we take the Poincaré section, which is uh, just one x1 one squared <coughs> x1 mu, and we dot it with the responding object for the second point. And we can rewrite this with indices. I'll just write it in this way. Since it's the same function, I don't have to actually put uh, indices here. And so you can see that it's kind of is a product of things which act on a single point, but these things have 
a vector index in the, of the conformal group. So the idea would be to generalize this would be not to look at differential operators which are conformally invariant, <coughs> but if you wish differential operators which are conformally covariant, in other words, we will look at differential operators which have, uh, in addition to this thing, a finite dimensional conformal group index. And I will explain precisely what the transformation properties of these operators are in a second. So let me now discuss what these operators are, what is their group theoretic origin is. We yeah. also need to be able to change the internal guy with operators. Yes, we will also be able to do that. Uh, this is not obvious at all from this picture, uh, but it will become clear soon how to do that. Okay. Um, so we are kind of looking at objects D, which have a finite dimensional index A. Uh, so A is kind of, is an index of uh, finite dimensional Irrep, which will denote that W of a conformal group in D plus one comma one. So in principle, it could also be a fermionic representation or any other representation. It's just in this example, it's a vector representation. And the thing that uh, I want to say is that when I act on an oper with this oper differential operator in some primary, it transforms as a different primary. But this is kind of weird of way of phrasing this because this has an index and this do doesn't. So what I will do is I'll take a basis EA of this finite dimensional representation and I'll tensor this guy to this basis. And then I will say that this tensor product transforms as a primary where now the conformal transformations act both on this O and on this EA. And the transformation of this EA cancels non, sort of non-invariance of the differential operator. Is the, this idea of transformation property clear? Are there any questions? Okay. So let us see what this does for um, this operator that we already have. So for this operator that we already have, we have EM, which is just the vector, st some standard basis in the vector representation of conformal group. The tensor it is XM of X multiplying all of X and all can have uh, some spin index. And this transforms as a new primary alpha O prime alpha of X. So this thing is just a number. So we can move it to the left of the tensor product. And what we find is an object. Let me write it here. Omega of X, which is just E M X M of X. And then this expression here is essentially saying that this is omega of x tensor O alpha of x. Uh, now, the idea is that, so x, m of x are just some numbers given by this formula, and e, m are vectors in this finite dimensional representations. So this thing is a vector in a finite dimensional representation, so you can ask how it transforms. The statement that this thing has conformal conform transformation properties precisely that of a primary scalar operator of dimension minus one. So let me explain a little bit about this. So this omega of x transforms as a scalar primary of delta 
equals minus one. What that means is that if you, so there is some action of conformal group on this representation W, so if you have some representation of a group element, so G is in uh, spin D. One, and then if you act with this operator, with this generator on this element, so just remember that omega of x is simply an element of fine dimensional representation. This is, uh, like this is, gives you the usual formula of uh, how, how conformal transformations act on uh, scalar operators, where omega is some rescaling factor and uh, the x gets sent to x prime. This is just an identity between vectors in a fine dimensional representation. So you know how u of g acts on the basis vectors em. So you can check just that this identity holds. This is what it means that it transforms as a primary. But it's funny because we used to think, thinking that primaries have like Riemann modules associated to them. And uh, these Riemann modules are infinite dimensional. And here we have something in fine dimensional representation. This is okay because this, primar this primary transforms in a representation of conformal group which is short. So there is a particular differential equation which it satisfies. In this case it is uh, it is a statement that if you take two derivatives of omega of x and subtract traces, then we get zero. And it turns out that uh, this equation implies omega is a polynomial and it can be written precisely in this form for some functions, uh, uh, for these functions x, m. The general solution, is the basis of solutions to this differential equation is just given by these functions x, m of x where m goes from 1 to uh, d plus 2. Okay. So this is similar to conformal Killing equation in that if instead of um, instead of d taking W to be vector representation, we took W to be the adjoint representation, then we would get instead of scalar primary omega, we would get vector primary omega of dimension also minus one. We should satisfy conformal Killing equation. And as we know, conformal Killing equation has finitely many solutions and d greater than two. And the solutions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with conformal generators, which is equivalent to the statement that they said that in for this, so the, like the solutions for conformal Killing equation are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, conformal generators, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with, which are just the elements of the adjoint representation. And the analogous statement for this thing is that solutions of this differential equation are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, uh, elements of vector representation. And in general, for any for any finite dimensional representation, for any w, you can have a you will have a function omega alpha of x, which uh, transforms in some particular finite dimensional representation of spin d which depends on which W you choose, which is equal to the A contracted with some set of functions. Omega is omega alpha A, so it carries the spin D index and conformal index, which depend on X. So this is just some explicit functions which you can find. And uh, uh, this thing just belongs to the to the um, fine dimensional representation, and if you start take and and if these vectors transform as they should according to W, then this thing transforms as a, pr as a, as a primary, and uh, if you start taking derivatives of omega, you find differential equations which imply that only finitely many descendants of omega are non zero. Omega is a polynomial in X, and you get that the Verman module of omega is essentially isomorphic to representation W. Uh, 
Uh, are there any questions about this picture of fine dimensional representations? Yeah, I, I don't, uh, the answer is that this doesn't generalize to differential operators. This differen if, you, if you ask for a differential operator, you can't have this. The point is that this is not a differential operator, and this is the only reason you can raise it to a fractional power. When you take differential operators, you can't raise them to fractional powers anymore. But if you, make, make, if you are fine with raising differential operators to fractional powers, then you'll be able to take the differential operators that are the right and raise them to fractional powers. But first, you will need to contract them. Yeah, which are hard to compute, so we're not interested in them. What's the relation between omega and alpha, or between w and alpha? So if, if you take, um, so the, the conformal group, it contains the dilatation subgroup uh, times spin d. And if you just decompose w with respect to the subgroup, you will get, uh, sum of, uh, so W will decompose into direct sum of uh, some subspaces which have fixed scaling dimension and representation rho. And the representation of alpha is the, uh, is the rho which corresponds to the lowest scaling dimension, sorry, yeah, to the lowest scaling dimension in, in this decomposition. So for example, if you take uh, Vector representation, essentially there, there is a vector E plus, which scales, which has scaling dimension plus one. There is a vector E minus, which has scaling dimension minus one. And then there is a vector E mu. So this, these guys are from a basis of uh, W, which is just the vector representation. And so this vector is the uh, lowest dimension vector, and it is just equal to omega of zero, which is the primary. And it's, it is a scalar. If you do the same exercise for a joint representation, then the lowest dimension generator in a joint representation is the uh, special conformal generator, and it's a vector. So this is why this thing is a vector for a joint representation. And then you can do this in general for, for any representation. The statement is that the lowest dimensional component will be an irreducible representation of spin d. Okay, so... Uh, The knowledge that we can interpret this finite dimensional vectors as primaries gives a nice interpretation of this thing. Because here we just take primary, which is like infinite dimensional, and we just take a primary, which is this simpler kind of primary. And we, what we do is just try to construct primary op new primary operators out of their product. This is kind of working in free field theory, but sort of more formal. In free field theory, you can multiply operators together to get, get new primary operators, and this is what we're doing here. So this is, and the thing that is written there is sort of the simplest differential operator, sorry, it's the simplest primary operator which you can construct out of two other primaries. You just multiply these primaries together. But there are more interesting ones. For example, uh, let me consider the case when uh, O is a scalar. So the example that's written there is just O of X is omega of X tensor O of X. So you can just ignore this tensor sign. It's just from mathematical carefulness, I guess. Uh, uh, so this is the simplest way to construct it, but Let's assume for simplicity that O is a scalar and O prime then is also a scalar. We can construct the vector O prime by taking V mu omega of X tensor O of X and adding the sum coefficient uh, omega of X tensor V mu O of X. And uh, Sorry? Oh, because I, here I'm just doing an example when I'm talking about vector representation of conformal groups, so I'm working with this omega. So I fixed, the, I fixed, I fixed W, so 
omega mu corresponds to, so let me separate this. So th this is just an example for, uh, so this is an example for W being a joint of conformal group. So this is not what I'm doing there. There I'm still working in vector. But yeah, if uh, you can just multiply, if you're in a joint, you can just multiply by omega mu, and this will be the simplest thing that you can do. In the uh, maybe I should, so in this, just multiplying by omega mu would correspond to differential operator, which is not differential, and in embedding space it has uh, this representation. It's just multiplying by this thing. It increases spin by one and transforms in a joint representation and it satisfies all the properties. So this is actually one of the operators that you use in your paper. Uh, okay, but here I'm just sticking to W equal to vector representation. So, so its primary is a scalar of dimension minus one. And this is one way to construct a, uh, one way to construct a uh, primary out of omega and O. And this is another way. And this coefficient C, you can fix it by demanding that Can you hear me again? Great. Um, so you can just set o x equals zero and uh, uh, ask for this to be annihilated by special conformal transformations, and this will fix that c should be just equal to delta, where delta is dimension of O. And this will now transform as a primary. This is this is precisely the same thing as you do if you take two free scalars. So now, for a second, we will th talk about physical operators. So if we take uh, a free field theory of two scalars, then there are uh, primary operators constructed from products of phi, primary operators constructed from, from products of phi 2, and there are primary operators constructed from phi 1, phi 2. So this, this kind of operator will be uh, an operator which belongs to uh, phi 1 times phi 2 OP. There will be a, a primary which transforms like which looks like d, d phi 1 phi 2 plus uh, some combination times uh, phi 1, some coefficient times phi 1 d phi 2. So this is precisely the same type of logic, it's just that we are using this formal operator here. And to to simplify notation a little bit less, also uh, contract this with a null polarization z mu, as we did yesterday. And to get the differential operator, uh, let me just use this definition. So this is just equal to um, em tensor delta z mu v mu x m x times o of x plus um, z mu x m of x times v mu of o of x. So this is just a rewriting of this uh, equation using definition of omega. And now I just define this thing to be the differential operator acting on O at x and also the function of polarization z. And you can see that this is a very explicit differential operator. This embedding space x is just a function, which is written down there. 
and uh, everything else is just differentiating O. So you can see that now this differential operator depends on X, which is fine because our differential operator is not supposed to be translation invariant. It's supposed to transform in some way with respect to translations because translations is just some element of the conformal group. And this new operator, this O prime, it has spin equal one and dimension equal, uh, so dot J prime is one and delta prime is just delta because uh, you can check, you can just count omega head dimension minus one, we added one derivative, so we didn't change the scaling dimension. And you can check that uh, after you plug in the expressions for x, that for, that this can, that for plus component you'll get like something which uh, transform, which has a derivative only for, sorry, for minus component you'll have something which is a derivative for mu component, you'll have something which is uh, uh, derivatives times coordinate or constant, and for plus component, you, uh, for minus component, you'll have something which is uh, uh, just x or x squared times derivative. So the kind of the, the rule how dimensions add in this expression depends on which in index you plug in because different indices have different scaling dimensions. But the simplest way to see this is from this expression where we just know that omega has scaling dimension minus one. Okay, so this gives us a new differential operator, which is now actually a differential operator, and now actually changes spin. So we can go to this uh, picture, and now we actually know what this black box is. It's not so black anymore. We know that we have a differential operator here, but this differential operator has a finite dimensional index, which I'll denote by a wiggle line. We have a differential operator here, which also has a wiggly line. And they're connected together. So before, what I discussed here, we were putting this simple differential operator, which is just equal to xm, which was not a differential operator at both points. And now we can, for example, put this new differential operator at this point, and it will increase the spin of this operator uh, one. So let me actually, uh, write down a little bit better notation. So this thing I will denote d zero plus because it doesn't change scaling dimension but increases the spin. And I will also denote this uh, previous operator which we had by d minus zero because it didn't change spin. So this is just xm x. So this doesn't change spin but it decreases dimension by one. So before we had a picture where this was d minus zero, d minus zero. This was not interesting, but now we can say, okay, let's just put d uh, zero plus here. And now this thing, so this was a scalar conformal block. This was for scalar four point function. And now this will be a conformal block for a four point function with a, a vector operator and a new primary dimension too. Are there any questions about this idea at this point? Yeah. So in the, M, the, in the final operator, the D and O, so the M index remains? Yes, I, M index remains. That was the entire point. That we, if, 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 if it didn't have any index and was conformally invariant, then it would require O to have very specific scaling dimension as I discussed over there. So we fix this by allowing it to have an index. So it doesn't commute with conformal group generators. It now commutes with them up to matrices which act on this index. But for a spin-run operator, let's say, or xd, I'm supposed to think of it as a spin-run operator, right? After we have contracted with the polarization. Yeah, but this still has the conformal group index. So if you add here back this basis element, then this whole tensor product transforms as a vector primary. But if you remove it, it's, it's, it doesn't have a transformation property of a primary, but it has the like, transformation property of a primary twisted by finite dimensional representation. So, and if you act with one such operator here and here, you get two sort of non-primaries which are twisted in the same way, so you can contract their indices and their, this twisting cancels out. Okay, so the real vector was the one with the PM tensor in it. 
Yeah, so here. Okay. So this is, a, this is a vector operator, and this has an EM tensor. If you strip off, we just get the differential operator. We are dropping the EM, so we, maybe I should write this out more explicitly. So we have this conformal block. Um, so let me confirm the block for this will be G of x1, x4. I will not draw indices. And what we do here is we uh, add with D0 plus on leg 2. I should probably write bigger. D0 plus on leg 2. And it has this index m. We act with d minus 0 and leg 1. And it also has index m. And we are contracting these two indices. And this gives us now this thing together is a differential operator which acts on two points, but is conformally invariant. It doesn't have indices anymore. So, I mean, you, you can say words in a way which they will make it that there is no conceptual difference. But for, I guess traditionally we think of Z as just some argument which you can plug some number in. So things are functions of Z in the same way as they're functions of X. And for EM, I just think is a particular element in vector space which you cannot change, it's just like some vector, but you can rephrase everything that, it, that this is equivalent language. Uh, so they, they, here, they commute because they act on different points. But if you have several operators acting on one point, they, they in general, they don't commute and there's some interesting algebra. Uh, so this thing doesn't change the dimension but increases the spin. So it, it secretly adds a polarization for this guy. So this, this will give a vector which depends now on a, uh, a vector conformal block which depends now x1, uh, z1, x2, and so on. OK? There is no z, sorry, yeah, z2, sorry, you're right. x2, z2. Yeah, and here also it's uh, phi 1 prime and v2, sorry. Uh, okay, so let me now say something more general about this thing. So this operator transforms in, you can think of this as uh, having some So you can think of this operator as having some, uh, you can think of O as, in a sense, element of Verma module, which I'll denote by V, the scan dimension delta, and I'll generalize now to arbitrary representation rho, which is just a kind of span of uh, O alpha at zero, D mu, alpha at zero, and so on. And this operator omega of x, we shall again generalize it. It belongs to this finite dimensional representation, which is a span of, which is just finite dimensional representation, and you can also think of it as being span of finitely many derivatives of Omega because omega has only finitely many derivatives. And so what we are looking for, we are looking for uh, Verma modules corresponding to O prime. So we have this O prime, which transforms, belongs to its own Verma, Verma module. And the thing that we are looking for, we are looking that this Verma module belongs to the tensor product of W with uh, delta is the Verma module of O. Uh, and in principle, 
you can just use some representation theory to comp compute what this tensor product is. It has some direct decomposition in, into some new Verma modules, delta i, rho i. So I should say that this is valid. So this is valid for generic delta. If delta is like integer, half integer, or something like that, uh, for special values of delta, this can fail because some representation, this representation, this tensor product will not be comp completely reducible. It will not decompose into sum of uh, irreducible Verma modules. But for generic delta, which is the case we care about, like say if delta is, uh, I don't know, uh, dimension of spin three operator, lightest spin three operator in Ising model, then this works. Uh, so in principle, we can write down a formula which is valid for any given row, but it's kind of not very, I mean, there is a formula, you can find it in our paper, but uh, I will not write it down. Instead, I will tell you a formula which is valid also, valid also for gene generic row. And the formula which is valid for generic, generic row, so this, this is the formula for the standard product, looks as follows. So you have a direct sum, and you sum over all weights mu, which appear in representation w. What you do is you take delta and rho, you combine them into a single weight vector, and you add mu to them. So this formula is true, if, essentially this formula is true if all m1, m2, m3, m and so on, which describe rho are sufficiently large. Because, and let me explain what I mean by this in case of vector representation in the example of the vector representation. So in the first lecture we described representations of spin group by these numbers mi. And these numbers were the lengths had this property, and there, there was some difference uh, between even and odd dimensions at the end of the sequence, which I will ignore for now. I'll just imagine that only few first mi are non-zero and uh, dimension is sufficiently large. But I don't have to make this assumption. This is just for simplicity of discussion. And we, we interpreted this as lengths of rows and Young diagram. Uh, so the first length was M1, 2, M3, M4, uh, but the requirement that MI are integers or half integers and satisfy these inequalities was the requirement. So this MI in principle just describe weights of, conformal, of spin D and this requirement that they are non-negative uh, satisfy these inequalities and that they are uh, integers or half integers is just a requirement that this weight is, an, uh, is a dominant weight, so it corresponds to finite dimensional reducible representations. In general, if you're just asking about weights of uh, an algebra, these things can be um, just arbitrary real complex numbers depending on what you're talking about. And the point is that Verma module is described by a particular weight of, uh, so this is spin D. Verma module is described by a particular weight of spin on D plus one. And because it has an uncompact direction, there is one weight which doesn't have to be an integral weight for representations to make sense. And if you take a similar example, so these are our components of uh, rho, so this part is just rho, so this is rho, and here we just add a new rho, which kind of is not, which has dimension minus, which has length minus delta, so minus delta joins as a first member of this kind of family. And uh, if, if we have a relation that minus delta 
So for this, if you have a relation that minus delta is greater or equal to m1, greater or equal to m2, greater or equal to zero, and this, all these numbers happen to be integers or half integers, then this weight will actually describe a weight of a finite dimensional representation of conformal group. But uh, we don't have to take a, talk only about finite dimensional representations of conformal group, and then delta can be anything, but these guys are still restricted to be integers and half integers. So weights form, so this is what I mean when I put uh, in this formula delta and rho together. I, I'm just talking about this kind of combined weight of the conformal group. Now, what are the weights of, say, vector representations? So these weights, they form a linear space, so we can just, if we have a list of these guys, and for example, the highest weight of a vector representation will be, uh, highest weight of a vector representation will be just, uh, so vector representations denoted by this. this. These diagrams, when we talk about representations, we uh, denote the highest weight, so the highest weight is just a box, and it, so this first row corresponds to delta, and then we have m1, m2, and so on. So this tells you what the dimension is and what the spin is for a vector representation. So dimension is minus one because we have one box here, and the spin is zero. That's in part to answer the question of what is this in general. Uh, but this is only the highest weight, and you can ask what are the uh, uh, what is the most general weight in vector representation. And the answer is that the weights in vector representations have this form: it's plus minus one and all zeros, or zero and plus minus one here, and so on. There are roughly speaking d over two. Uh, Components, I just don't want to distinguish between uh, even and odd, but they're roughly speaking d over two components, and for each component you get plus or minus, so you get d possible weights. So for a tensor product with a vector representation, this implies that, uh, let me write this explicitly. For tensor product with vector representation, this implies that if you have, say, the Ramam module, which had some Young diagram and also had this minus delta in your tensor and vector representation, then the things which appear in the right hand side are the Ramam modules with some. Uh, young diagrams, where these young diagrams are obtained from this one by changing, say, changing delta by plus minus one, by changing this first row by plus minus one, second row plus plus, plus minus one, and so on. And uh, we have found two differential operators, and they correspond to the weight. Uh, so one corresponds to the weight of this type with sine minus, which was uh, this differential operator, and the other one corresponds to the weight of this type, the sine plus. And uh, the multiplicities in the standard product are the same as weight multiplicities, and in vector representation there are no uh, weight multiplicities. So these are unique operators with, this, with these properties. But in general, with vector index, you have as many differential operators as there are weights in vector representation, so in general you get d, d plus two differential operators in the vector representation of conformal group. And, uh, but if you, for example, restrict yourself only to traceless symmetric representations and you don't want to differential operators which take you outside of traceless symmetric representations, then there are only four because you can only change the first row, which is delta, or the second row, which is the spin. We have written down two of them, and I'm not going to write the other two because they are complicated. <laughs> uh, but there is an expression. Uh, so here I described to you a particular way to construct these operators, and you can prove that all such operators are can be constructed in this way. And now I will just comment briefly that 
it's very useful to use embedding formalism to write down these operators because an embedding formalism, like I already use kind of embedding formalism just like writing by using this x of uh, xm. And the reason it was convenient because embedding formalism is already built inside a finite dimensional representation of control groups, so it kind of has these finite dimensional objects built in. Uh, are there any questions before I go to embedding formalism construction? Okay. So, So uh, I will just, basically what I'll do, I'll write express, down expressions for the two differential operators that we are familiar with in embedding formalism. And I explain uh, briefly what are the, what, how to get them. So we had this differential operator minus zero, which is written over there. In embedding formalism, it's naturally just multiplying your correlation function by xm. The second differential operator, d0 plus, has this expression. So from these expressions, it's very easy to see that the are confirmed, if they are well-defined, and by what I mean by well-defined, I will explain in a second. If they're well-defined, they're obviously conformally invariant because conformal group acts linearly in this embedding space, and we just used inner products to construct them. So they work just fine, and you can observe their properties here. So if you remember, we discussed that primary operators in embedding space are denoted by these functions, which, uh, have a, which are polynomial in Z of degree which is equal to spin and which are homogeneous in X with this property. So you can see that this operator doesn't change the degree in Z, but it changes the scaling property by raising the homogeneity degree, in other words, by decreasing dimension by minus one. So decreasing dimension by one, so it has precisely these properties. And for this operator, you can see that, see that it increases degree in z by one, uh, and it doesn't change the degree in x. So it, doesn't, it increases spin, but doesn't change the scaling dimension. <coughs> okay, so conformal invariance is obvious. The, the, the action on the weight of conformal group is also obvious. What is not obvious is that these operators are well defined. Because if you remember, these objects were only defined on the subspace where x squared is the same, is equal to x dot z equal to z squared equal to zero. If you have a function which, defined, which is defined, say, on x squared equals to zero, you can just differentiate it with respect to x because derivatives with respect to x can take derivatives along the null cone, but they can also take derivatives outside of the null cone. So I need to tell you how to interpret this differential operator in the first place. So, uh, and moreover, there was an another condition that if we change z, shift z by x, then the ch it should remain invariant. So this operator has also to preserve this property. And the way to, so there are two pro problems. We need to check this and we need to explain what this operator means for functions you should define on, on these things. And this is what I'll do now. So to interpret this differential operator, you need to extend your, this function away from the null cone, away from basically away from the solutions of the, to these equations. However, 
this involves some degree of arbitrariness. You can do this in various ways. So the result of action of this differential operator should not depend on how you've done that. And you can do slightly different versions of it, but we will also require that the extension respects the, this property. You could, after you extend away from this equation, you can add here that you can add here terms which are proportional to these things. You can allow them to appear, but it will not allow them to appear. I will consider only extensions which preserve this property. And then the statement is that we need to check that this action of this differential operator after we restrict back onto this surface does not depend, uh, the action of this differential operator does not depend on the extension. So the way to check this is to see what happens if you, so suppose you act as a differential operator in some function f of x and z. which has been extended, and now we consider a different extension. So a different extension will be proportion, can be proportional to x squared, let's say. So this thing vanishes on the null cone, so it doesn't affect the restriction to the null cone, but it gives you a new extension. So you need to check that after you apply this differential operator to this term, this term will map into something which vanishes on this locus, and uh, this essentially has to be proportional, means that it has to be proportional to x squared, x dot z, or uh, z squared. And you can check, indeed, that this is what it happens, because this term does not differentiate at all. This term uh, can either, this derivative can either hit x squared or f prime. If it hits f prime, then result is proportional to x squared. If it had, hits x, then the result is proportional to x dot z. So with respect to this kind of variations of extension, this operator is well-defined. Uh, but we have other extensions here, which are proportional to z squared and x dot z. And to be very careful, uh, you need to be, <coughs> it's a little more complicated because you need to, you cannot just act, add x dot z here because this thing does not, this kind of extension does not respect this property. So what you need to do is you need to uh, come up with something like x dot z minus x squared. Uh, sorry. Let me write these indices or I'll get confused. This term is proportional to x dot z. Cont it, it contains x dot z and x squared, so it's kind of term by which you can extend, but it also satisfies this property. So you need to add this kind of terms and check that they are annihilated. And you also need to consider corresponding type of terms for z squared. This is more involved, so I will not do the calculation right now. But you can check that this operator indeed satisfies this, and then you can check that it also preserves this property. So this, pro this property means that the operator is invariant under uh, x dot dz, and you can check that this differential operator commutes with uh, this thing. And the reason you find delta plus j here, so delta and j are the scaling dimension and spin of the operator in which you act, is that sometimes when you ch check these properties, you'll get uh, things which contain z dot dz or x dot dx. And when acting on functions of definite homogeneity, this is just reduced to j or minus delta. And you need to use this in order to check that this indeed is, satisfies all the properties. So are there any questions about these consistency conditions? Yes. Yeah, is th this has to be interior to this surface. Yeah, that's precisely what it is. And it has to respect this property. 
this is why we didn't have to worry about it in this construction because we're, we're precisely looking at differential operators which are already interior to the surface, but conformal invariance was less obvious. But this the kind of things you can teach Mathematica to check them and then you don't have to try too hard. Okay, so let me now explain in the last uh, 10 minutes, I guess, how uh, this helps us to, uh, how these operators help us to get the conformal blocks. So the thing which I already discussed is how we can take a conformal block and start changing three-point functions in it. So what I said was that if you take a conformal block, and you act with a pair of these differential operators here. So this was conformal block. So this part of the diagram is a conformal block. You can think of this being as, for example, scalar conformal block where external operators are scalars. And then this is just some differential operator you apply to this conformal block. But then after you look at this diagram this way, so you look at this part, this is proportional to, as I mentioned already, it's proportional to a new three-point function. So to make this more clear, let me denote scalar line, scalar operators by dashed lines. So you know, scalars, dashed lines, uh, W bosons are laser lines. <laughs> this is why we call this W. Uh, so let's imagine this is a scalar conform block, for example. Uh, and then after you act with differential operators, then can be some gen gen general operator with spin. And so after, after we focus on this part of the diagram, it has conformal transformation properties of a three-point function, so it must be proportional to a three-point function with uh, some spinning operators. And the statement is that uh, if you fix this to, so the inter internal line is some, has, scaling some, has some scaling dimension in intermediate representation and then spin D representation, and for scalar conform block, this has to be traceless symmetric tensor, so denoted by spin J. Um, So this doesn't, doesn't change. The, what changes are these external lines. And uh, the statement which is proven in the case of traceless symmetric operators, but maybe in some other cases, but is not proven in general, but is true empirically, is that you can get all possible three-point functions in this way by uh, starting with a scalar, scalar, spin j, and you can get all something else, something else, spin j. This is empirically true. And like there is no reason for this not to be true because there is there is plenty of these operators. You can, you can check that the number of ways you can act is way more than the number of structures that you need, and uh, there seems to be no selection rule which would prohibit you to get any particular structure. And then you can change this structure on the right, and you can get conformal block for exchange of traceless symmetric operator for any external set of uh, representations. However, this doesn't. Uh, allow you to change to get things which exchange non-traceless symmetric representations. And as soon as you have the trivial spin on the external legs, there are uh, select conformal selection rules allow non-traceless symmetric representations to be exchanged unless you're in three dimensions. But even in three dimensions, there is a there are traceless symmetric representations, but there are, then there are also fermionic representations, and you cannot get in this way uh, conform blocks which exchange fermions in three D. So we need to do better. Uh, but before we do better, are there any questions about how to do not good enough? Okay. So let me very quickly go how through how to do better. I'm going slower than I expected, but whatever. So the idea is to, here we studied 
we looked at how, what happens if we act with two weight shifting operators on a three point function. Now the idea would be to just act with one. So we have a three point function. Oh yeah, I said weight shifting operator, I didn't say this name, but the standard product rule which I just raised, it shifts the weights of the original representation and for this reason I will call these operators weight shifting operators. Um, so we have a three point function and uh, it has operators one, two, three, and I act on one of the legs with uh, finite dimension, with this weight shifting operator, I get some fine dimensional index, and I get some new operator, but I'll call this operator three and call this operator three prime for future convenience. And this is W. So this diagram kind of looks like a conformal block, right? And if you are agnostic about what happens inside, this kind of looks like a four point function, except that this is a fine dimensional index. But I already told you how to take finite dimensional indices and turn them into primary operators. So this thing, if you write formulas, it is O1, O2, then you have differential operator with index A acting on O3 prime. So it has this fine dimensional index but you can contract if you, it's not necessary for the argument, but you can imagine contracting this with this thing that we discussed. And then this will have confirmed transformation properties of a four point function. So this is, this gives you an object of this form. Where you can think of it in two ways. It's either a three point function. So on the one hand, you can think of this as O1, O2, O3, omega, kind of a four point function in terms of its transformation properties. But on the other hand, the transformation properties, you can also describe them as saying it's just a three point function, which is not conformally invariant, but has a fine dimensional index. So the statement is that if you forget how you get this object, if you just ask how many such objects can I write down, the answer is that the, the space is finite dimensional and you can write it down a formula for its dimension. It's obvious from the point of view, from this point of view, because you can just again fix the positions of three operators to some fixed configuration and you get some indices from these three operators, but, and you also get the finite dimensional conformal index, but since the finite dimensional conformal index is finite dimensional, you can do the same kind of analysis and find that there are finitely many tensor structures for, for these objects. And you recover the usual tensor structures by set, setting A to be a, a trivial representation. From the four point function point of view, the statement is that this object satisfies a constraint differential equation, so the space of solutions is finite dimensional. And if you take the four point function of you, of you, this is precisely a conformal block for this four point function. And you can then uh, ask what is the crossing equation in this picture? So we could also get, uh, we can also get right conformal blocks in another channel. Sorry? In the previous diagram, you had the cross where the internal lines were meeting. Uh, so yes, but this was for actual conformal blocks. I'm saying that these things are, are like conformal blocks. You can interpret them as conformal blocks, but this is a different kind of representation. The, those are also very special conformal blocks for this kind of finite dimensional objects. This is just, this is an analogy which can be made precise, but I don't want to spend time on making it precise. So th this diagram is completely different. This is a scalar conformal block, and we're using this W just goes here to change it. Here I'm taking, so here W is acting on a four-point function. This four-point function is some complicated object. Here I'm doing something different. I'm taking something simple, which is just a three-point function, and I'm acting with it on a single leg with W. So this is the formula. I just literally take three-point function and act with differential operator, with the weight shifting operator and one of the operators. I'm just saying that the result of this action 
can be interpreted as a conformal block for this four-point function. And I'm saying that using this analogy, which again can be made precise, uh, there also is a, another channel where you act on a different leg. And you just choose this differential operator and you choose this intermediate representation such that the, the leg which goes on the outside is fixed. And here you also can choose different representations, three prime and different differential operators here, let you just keep W, one, two, and three fixed. So you can count how many choices you have here, you can count the dimension of this space, and you can count how many choices you have here, and all these things are equal. So what it, the statement is that objects of this form form a basis for objects of this form, as well as do these guys. So there must be existed crossing transformation between which relates this basis to this basis. It's like a toy version of conformal bootstrap which has no physical significance, but it's useful for kinematic computations that there is this fine dimensional space of four-point functions where you can compute all conformal blocks, so there are fine for many of those, and you can compute the crossing kernel, which is fine dimensional matrix. And I will not uh, write formulas because I'm already five minutes over time. Let me just quickly draw um, some diagrams which explain how it can change the intermediate representation. So the way you should interpret this relation, so let me erase this thing and just say that you can write this as a sum over, oper over representations one prime and uh, so this is differential operator D or this differential operator is D with some coefficients which you can interpret as 6J symbols of a uh, particular very special type of 6J symbols of conformal group that it allows you to take operators which act on one leg of three-point functions and move them to another leg. And the way it helps with changing the intermediate representation of a conformal block is imagine that you have this conformal block. You have a scalar, you have a spin leg, you have uh, some non trace symmetric representation here, you have this cross, and you have another spin and the scalar here. So the thing you do is first you apply this trick, but in a different way. So you take this thing and replace it by um, so in principle you can do So you just do this replacement. You act, you write this three-point function as differential operator acting this leg and this leg and contract it, uh, where you can get to choose what runs here in the inside. And I will just choose this to be a scalar for simplicity. Because you can choose it to be anything, and I will choose it to be scalar. It's not the thing that you should do in practice. In practice, you should choose it to be spin J representation. Otherwise, the differential operator will be just too complicated if the spin is large. But for simplicity, let me just mention this is a scalar. So I'll just redraw this here. I, I get rid of part of this line, and I get this contraction. And now, the thing that I didn't explain, but which is also true with the same kind of logic, is that you can move this uh, differential operator past this contraction. Uh, so you just have to believe me. So you can replace it and put this differential operator here. at the cost of some coefficient. And I don't need this anymore. And now, so this is some representation W. And now we have this line, but it's kind of, we, we kind of almost changed the internal representation, but it's awkward because we're acting on something inside the conformal block and we can only act on the conformal block from the outside. So the idea is to use this crossing transformation to bring this on, let me change this, to bring this on to this leg. So we look at this part of the diagram and it looks precisely uh, as a rotation version of this. So we can rewrite this as a sum
and w goes here. And the sum is over, uh, let me call this operator O3 prime. So you, you sum over O3 prime and over this differential operator D. But there are finitely many terms in the sum and you can compute the coefficients. And so after this transformation, you can look at this piece of the, of the diagram and see that this is a confirmed block exchange in a scalar, which is way better than exchanging trace of symmetric representation. But as I said, in principle, you could have uh, uh, chosen trace symmetric representation, and then this is just some delta spin j. And uh, then this is something exchange in trace symmetric representation, and so you can add a couple of more of these lines here to get uh, to express everything in terms of a scalar block. And the interpretation of this diagram is that you have a traceless symmetric thing running here in this channel. So if you just cut the diagram here, you have a traceless symmetric operator running here and you have a finite dimensional representation. So this is, a, you get, ex the thing that is exchanged is essentially an tensor product of finite dimensional representation is traceless symmetric representation, which can contain non-traceless symmetric representations. And the sum is just taking care of selecting just one component so that everything else is canceled and you get one component. And uh, I'll stop, I'll just mention that in this way you can, comp I mean, we already have explicit expressions for all uh, kind of simplest uh, non traceless symmetric blocks in 3D and 4D. So in 3D, the only non traceless symmetric block is a, uh, is a um, fermionic exchange. And in 4D, <coughs> there are infinitely many non traceless symmetric blocks, but we have differential operators for computing them all. And you can also run this in higher dimensions if you wish to. So I'll stop here. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Are there? Okay. Thank you.